get it started here. We're back at 7.41, time for Ross and Reports, and this morning we're starting a special series called Emergency 911. When you call for help, you assume you're going to be found, but as Jeff found, don't be so sure. He's got an eye-opening investigation. Jeff, good morning to you. Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. We have been investigating this for weeks with our friends from Gannett. I don't know about you, but I've always assumed when I call 911, they are tracing my exact location so they can find me, but experts say... That's just not the case in many places. The 911 system so old, dispatchers can't find you 60% of the time when you need the most. And victims are dying. One of the most recent cases is absolutely heartbreaking. The victim using her final breaths, begging the dispatcher for help. 911 was attached to the emergency. I'm in a car and I'm late. You are listening to a panicked woman trapped inside her sinking SUV. Where is where I am? Chanel Anderson was delivering newspapers in the dark in suburban Atlanta when she careened into this pond. She knew right where she was. The fairway in Batesville. Batesville and what? The but 911 dispatchers can't find her on their map. Time ticking away. Well, I'm moving it all very quickly. Uh, give me the address one more time. It's not working. Uh, okay, I it took first responders nearly 20 minutes to get to her. Ma'am, I lost her. Chanel didn't make it. You're telling me 911 doesn't have the capability to locate someone? That is absolutely absurd. Turns out 911 centers rely on nearby cell towers to locate you. A gaping hole in the system, first exposed by WXIA's Brendan Keefe. It stops at the city line. If you hit a cell tower outside their jurisdiction, they don't know where you are. And that's what happened to Chanel. She hit a cell tower just outside the county line. Experts say this is dated technology, yet many 911 call centers continue to use it. Dated because these days our smartphones know exactly where we are. So why not use that technology, they ask. For example, this is where Chanel's SUV went into the pond, the exact location. And if I pull my smartphone out of my pocket and click on the map app, watch this. Watch that dot. It will tell you exactly within seconds where I am, down to the pond location. I could order food. I could order a car to this precise location. Yet if I called 911 right now, who knows? 911, where is your emergency? The problem so bad. Watch this. Let's do a test 911 call. 911, what's the emergency? Hi, this is Jeff Rawson with NBC News. Just want to know if you can tell me where our location is on your computer. Showing 4641 West Thompson Road. That's not here. Absolutely not. That's about a quarter mile away. And we're standing in the actual 911 center. That's it right down there. That's correct. And they still can't find us. That's correct. So who's responsible for fixing the system? The Federal Communications Commission. Things must get better. The FCC chairman, Tom Wheeler, sitting down with me. So what are you doing to fix this? This is a challenge that we have got to take and we have taken head on. He says the FCC has oversight over wireless carriers, but not local 911 centers. Now pushing new rules to get everyone in line. The new rules that you have adopted, the FCC has adopted, uh, demand 40% accuracy within the next two years. How bad is it right now if in two years the goal is 40%, which I think we can agree is not a great number. We have to push to make sure that both the wireless carriers and the local 911 folks are prepared to be able to exceed that and to give the kind of expectation that you and I have a right to have when we call 911. But for Chanel's family, that's not good enough or fast enough. Her death was so senseless. Our 911 system doesn't work. So difficult listening to that 911 call. The FCC chairman also making headlines in our interview saying they are developing a 911 app.
sort of like Uber for 911. I asked when that'll be ready, but he said there is no timetable time table for that yet. You can get uh, going on that right yeah. away. I think a lot of people are going to yeah. be surprised what you just I was. Heard, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, coming up, we're going to have a lot more of our exclusive interview with I want to thank uh, NBC for letting us uh, play that video. I don't know if anybody was able to see that mm -hmm. when it was aired, but it's very informative as what we're looking here to address in our state. So with that, um, I want to move on to uh, somebody that's going to come and tell her story, uh, Linda Leong, I believe that's the proper pronunciation of your last name. Linda is a resident of uh, Rancho Santa Fe here in California and has a story to tell. I think it's appropriate that the legislature see firsthand the impacts of the 9-1 system here in our state and the difficulty of locating cell phone calls. So I want to thank you, Linda, for being here and, and uh, go ahead and share your, your story. Thank you, Assemblyman. My name is Linda Leong. I live in Rancho Santa Fe. I'm a single mother with two sons, Daniel Scuba, age 12, and David Scuba, age 10. And I brought them here today to watch the hearing since they're on spring break. I'm a self-employed financial planner with insurance, stockbroker, and securities principal licenses to practice. I'm here to share two personal emergencies that necessitated cell phone calls to 911 for help and the problems I experienced with those calls. The first involves my husband, Richard Scuba, who was a well-respected Rancho Santa Fe attorney, a real estate broker, and a Naval Academy graduate who served in Vietnam. He had a cardiac arrest on November 25, 2007, after his soccer game ended. The incident was on a Sunday after Thanksgiving, about a month after the wildfires in San Diego, and a month after his first grandson was born, whom he never got to meet. My boys and I had arrived at the soccer field, the latter half of Richard's soccer game, after church when he collapsed as soon as the game ended. Daniel and David were five and three at the time, and they witnessed their father's death. I called 911 from my cell phone while Richard's teammates laid him on his back on the grass. My call was placed on hold for, I don't know, maybe two or three minutes. And when the dispatch came on, she asked me the nature of my emergency. I replied that I think my husband, Richard Scuba, had a heart attack and we needed an ambulance immediately. She then asked for the address, to which I replied, I didn't know the address. There were over 25 people in the soccer field who also did not know the address. I described where we were located at the Rancho Santa Fe soccer field on Ramblas de las Flores between two cross streets, La Granada and La Aurelia, a mile from the Rancho Santa Fe fire station number one on El Fuego. The dispatch informed me that she could not forward my call without an address, to which I asked why couldn't she triangulate my cell phone position with the GPS technology embedded in my phone. She said she could not. By then, I realized Richard was turning purple, so I handed the phone over to a friend who continued to describe our location, and I started rescue breathing while friends were mon monitoring his pulse. Eventually, an ambulance arrived after I approximate between 15 to 20 minutes after my initial call, but it was not from, from that dispatch. It was from another cell phone call to our Rancho Santa Fe Private Security Patrol dispatch office, which is staffed 24-7. The patrol staff had to run next door, pound on the door of the fire station number one to ask for help in person. Richard did not make it. And I wonder what might have happened, what, what, what might have changed if my 911 call would have been routed directly to Northcom, our local PSAP, instead of to CHP. If my 911 call was not placed on hold, or if the dispatch operator would have forwarded my call to the local PSAP, based on my street references. My boys lost their father that day, and the 911 delays may have factored into Richard Scuba's lower chances of survival. I want them to know that I'm doing my best to help fix the 911 system so that unnecessary delays will not take place in a true emergency such as ours. I met with the Rancho Santa Fe Fire Chief, Nick Pavoni at the time, a month after my husband's death, who looked into my 911 call, he informed me that the 911 call was routed to CHP, who did not lo know the local landmarks. When I asked why my call wasn't automatically routed to the local PSAP, since we were five miles from the I-5 freeway and 10 miles from the I-15 freeway, 
Pavoni said he was told that within a year's time, he expected the cell phone calls to be transferred directly to local sheriff's dispatch. I learned five years later that this was not the case. Fast forward to June 8th of 2012. I was hit by a car while riding on a bicycle crossing a four-way stop at my kid's school at La Granada and Avenida de Acacias in Rancho Santa Fe. When I later received the CHP collision report, I contacted the two witnesses to thank them. The first told me I cracked the windshield of the car that hit me and flew 20 feet in the air before I landed in the street. The second witness got the ambulance for me, literally. He had first place not one, but two cell phone calls to 911 at that intersection. Both times his calls were placed on hold. He then got in his car, drove two blocks to the same fire station on El Fuego to get help. The ambulance went to the wrong intersection before finding me eventually. I was then transported to the trauma center at Scripps Memorial La Jolla. I was lucky and was released that night with a minor fracture in my left ankle, injuries to my head, and bruises all over. On both occasions, the 911 system failed me. I would argue that if this could happen to me not once but twice, it could happen to anyone. In my former career, 25 years ago, I was a pre-hospital analyst for emergency medical services with the health department in San Diego. It was my job to collect data on call times, but starting with the, first, the time first responders received the call, the time of dispatch, the time at scene, transport time to the nearest emergency room. What is not documented is the number of calls to 911 that are placed on hold, length of hold time, time lapse before the call is transferred to the local PSAP, if it is transferred at all, and in my case it was not. This is crucial missing information, especially in the case of cardiac arrest resulting in death, like what happened to my husband, Richard Scuba. In my humble opinion, our 911 system is broken based on today's standards of decreasing use of landlines in favor of cell phones. Given the increased volume of cell phone calls to 911 and given the fact that the majority of calls to 911 are routed by default to CHP, and I was told that because CHP got the calls because the mobile phones used to be car phones and CHP handled the freeway calls. I would argue that maybe the CHP dispatch staff may not have increased or adjusted upwards to, uh, to take care of the increased volume of calls. I learned several years ago there was a pilot study called the RED Project, routing on empirical data that was started around 2011. It analyzed by zip code how 911 calls are routed. It made recommendations on how calls from cell towers should be rerouted. Less than two years into the study, with only about 10% of all zip codes that were analyzed, the study was terminated with no notice. Today, I don't know what is in place to monitor if cell phone towers are routing calls to 911 correctly based on where the calls are originated. It seems to me there may be no one watching the hen house today. The bottom line is how our system, 911 system is financed is not keeping up with current trends in cell phone bill consolidation into family plans by the carriers to the point where the usage fees based on the bill may not necessarily be funding our, our 911 system appropriately. I have more comments, but I think uh, I, this is it for now. Okay. I want to thank you very much, Linda, for your willingness to drive here from the San Diego area and share your story, how that affected you personally. And I can share your same concerns because my background as an emergency responder, and I still work in the field occasionally, I, we still get those issues out there where, especially in park locations where people are visiting and something happens and you don't really know the exact location, you just know you're at the park and you do have that delay. So thank you for bring your testimony here with us this morning. Thank you for holding the session. Oh, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Boss, you had a question? Well, I, not so much a question. I just wanted to thank you for having the courage to be here today and sharing your story. And of course, you know, I, I'm, you, we are blessed with the knowledge that this has happened to you twice. You, of course, are cursed with that knowledge. Um, uh, what I 
What alarms me, of course, is how many people this has happened to who have no knowledge uh, that it happened to them, that they ha faced unnecessary delays that may have um, caused tragedies or uh, may have in uh, increased their, their level of danger. And it is particularly alarming to me that even afterwards, even after the, that tragedy, there is no mechanism uh, to ensure that that particular tower, which is so far from the freeway, is not being routed to the local PSAP. Um, so just want to uh, declare um, empathy with you and, and of course, um, alarm that this is happening to people in my district, in my community, and uh, uh, elsewhere in the state. Thank you very much. So with that, we have four panels of discussion today, and I want to bring up our first panel, which will consist of representatives from state agencies, the Office of Emergency Services, and the California Emergency Medical Service Authority. The California Public Utilities Commission was invited to present testimony, but they declined indicating that the CPUC is currently in regulatory discussion with the wireless companies on other issues and did not want to jeopardize that effort, but they will be submitting written testimony. So with that, we have uh, OES, Cal IMSA, and uh, just, those just those two can come forward. 